The Will to Change, Men, Masculinity, and Love, written by Bell Hooks. Chapter 6. Work. What's love got to do with it? Read and recorded by Sen Naomi Kirsch Schultz, June 14th, 2022. Before feminist movement boys were more likely to be taught at home and at school that they would find fulfillment in work. Today, boys hear a slightly different message. They are told that money offers fulfillment and that work is a way to acquire money, but not the only way. Winning the lottery, finding a wealthy partner, committing a crime for which you don't get caught, are paths to fulfillment that are as acceptable as working. These attitudes about the nature of work in patriarchal society have changed as capitalism has changed the nature of work. Few men, either now or in the future, can expect a lifetime of full employment. Nowadays, working men of all classes experience periods of unemployment. In order to keep the faith, patriarchal culture has had to offer men different criteria for judging their worth than work. As a primary foundation of patriarchal self-esteem, work has not worked for masses of men for some time now. Rather than throw out the whole outmoded patriarchal script so that the nature of work in our culture can be changed, men are offered addictions that make unsatisfying work more bearable. Patriarchal obsession with sex and the pornography it produces are promoted to soothe men subliminally, while they perform jobs that are tedious, boring, and oftentimes dehumanizing, jobs where their health and their well-being are at risk. Most male workers in our America, like their female counterparts, work in exploitative circumstances. The work they do and the way they are treated by superiors more often than not undermine self-esteem. One of the anti-feminist patriarchal sentiments that has gained ground in recent years is the notion that masses of men used to be content to slave away at meaningless labor to fulfill their role as providers, and that it is feminist insistence on gender equality in the workforce that has created male discontent. Underlying this assumption is the notion that women coming into the workforce, no longer looking to their men to be the sole providers for the family, have undermined the well-being of men in patriarchal culture. Yet many sociological studies of men at work done prior to feminist movement indicate that males were already expressing grave discontent and depression about the nature and meaning of work in their lives. This discontent does not receive the attention that male workers receive when they blame their unhappiness with the world of work on the feminist movement. In her massive journalistic treatise, Stift, The Betrayal of the American Man, Susan Faludi documents the reality that some males, especially older men, felt that changes in the valuation and nature of work, as well as competition with women for jobs, robbed them of the pride in being providers, creating what she called a quote-unquote masculinity crisis. The outer layer of the masculinity crisis, men's loss of economic authority, was most evident in the recessionary winds of the early 90s, as the devastation of male unemployment grew ever fiercer. The role of family breadwinner was plainly being undermined by economic forces that spat many men back into treacherous job market during corporate consolidations and downsizings. Even the many men who were never laid off were often gripped with the fear that they could be next, and that their footholds as providers were frighteningly unsteady. Masses of men in our culture may believe that their ability to provide for themselves and families is a measure of their manhood yet they often do not actually use their resources to provide for others. Feminist theorists, myself included, have for some time now called attention to the fact that the behavior of men who make money, yet refuse to pay alimony or child support, or their peers who head households yet squander their paycheck on individual pleasures, challenges the patriarchal insistence that men are eager to be caretakers and providers. Barbara Ehrenreich's The Hearts of Men was one of the first books highlighting the reality that many men are not eager to be providers, that the very idea of the playboy, quote-unquote, was rooted in the longing to escape this role and to have another means of proving one's manhood. Male heads of households who give a meager portion of their wages for the needs of their family can still have the illusion that they are providers. Nowadays, women's income can be the backup money that allows many patriarchal men to squander their paycheck on drugs, alcohol, gambling, sexual adventures, even as they lay claim to being the provider. Today's male worker struggles to provide economically for himself, and if he is providing for self and family, his struggle is all the more rigorous and the fear of failure all the more intense. Men who make a lot of money in this society and who are not independently wealthy 
usually work long hours, spending much of their time away from the company of their loved ones. This is one circumstance they share with men who do not make much money but who also work long hours. Work stands in the way of love for most men, then, because the long hours they work often drain their energies. There is little or no time left for emotional labor for doing the work of love. The conflict between finding time for work and finding time for love and loved ones is rarely talked about in our nation. It is simply assumed in patriarchal culture that men should be willing to sacrifice meaningful emotional connections to get the job done. No one has really tried to examine what men feel about the loss of time with children, partners, loved ones, and the loss of time for self-development. The workers Susan Faludi highlights in Stift do not express concern about not having enough time for self-reflection and emotional connection with self and others. <clears throat> There is very little research that documents the extent to which depression about the nature of work leads men to act violently in their domestic lives. Contemporary patriarchy has offered disappointed male workers a trade-off. The perks of manhood that a depressed economy takes away can be redeemed in the realm of the sexual through domination of women. When that world of sexuality is not fulfilling, males rage. In actuality, women are weary of male domination in the sexual sphere particularly. And rather than making for greater domestic bliss, men's turning to sex for the satisfaction that they do not receive at work intensifies strife. The movement of masses of women into the workforce has not undermined male workers economically. They still receive the lion's share of both jobs and wages. It has made women who work feel more entitled to resist domination than women who stay home dependent on a man's wages to survive. Working class and middle income women I have spoken with talk about the extent to which working outside the home after years of staying home bolstered their self-esteem and provided them with a different perspective on relationships. These women often begin to place greater demands on male spouses and lovers for emotional engagement. Faced with these demands, working men often wish that the little woman would stay home so that he could wield his absolute power, no matter the amount of his paycheck. In many cases, when a woman's paycheck is more than that of her male partner, he acts out to restore his sense of dominance. He may simply confiscate her paycheck and use it as he desires, thus rendering her dependent. He may increase his demands for sexual favors, and if that does not work, he can simply withhold sex, thus making a working woman who desires sex feel her power undermined. Most women who work long hours come home and work a second shift, taking care of household chores. They feel like their male counterparts, that there is no time to do emotional work, to share feelings and nurture others. Like their male counterparts, they may simply want to rest. Working women are far more likely than other women to be irritable. They are less open to graciously catering to someone else's needs than the rare woman who stays home all day, who may or may not caretake children. Domestic households certainly suffer when sexism decrees that all emotional care and love should come from women, in the face of the reality that working women, like their male counterparts, often come home too tired to deliver the emotional goods. Sexist men and women believe that the way to solve this dilemma is not to encourage men to share the work of emotional caretaking, but rather to return to more sexist gender roles. They want women, especially those with small children, to stay home. Of course, they do not critique the economy that makes it necessary for all adults to work outside the home. Instead, they pretend that feminism keeps women in the workforce. Most women work because they want to leave the house and because their families need the income to survive, not because they are feminists who believe that the working is a sign of liberation. When individual men stay home to do the work of homemaking and child rearing, the arrangement is still viewed as unnatural by most observers. Rather than being viewed as doing what they should do as people in relationships, homemaking men are seen as especially chivalrous, as sacrificing power and privileges they could have had as privileged male workers outside the home in order to do women's work inside the home. It has been through assuming the role of participatory, loving parents that individual men have oh. dared to challenge sexist assumptions and do work in the home that also invites them to learn relational skills. They document the rightness of feminist theory that argues that if men participated equally in child rearing, they would, like their female counterparts, learn how to care for the needs of others, including emotional needs. 
Even though more men actively parent to some degree than ever before in our nation's history, the vast majority of men still refuse to play an equal role in the emotional development of their children. They often use work as the excuse for emotional estrangement. Whether they regard themselves as pro or anti-feminist, most women want men to do more of the emotional work in relationships. And most men, even those who wholeheartedly support gender equality in the workforce, still believe that emotional work is female labor. Most men continue to uphold the sexist decree that emotions have no place in the work world and that emotional labor at home should be done by the females. Many men use work as the place where they can flee from the self, from emotional awareness, where they can lose themselves and operate from a space of emotional numbness. Unemployment feels so emotionally threatening because it means that there would be time to fill, and most men in patriarchal culture do not want time on their hands. Victor Sadler expresses his fear of having downtime in Rediscovering Masculinity, confessing, quote, I have learned how hard it is to give myself time, even an hour for myself a day. There are always things I'm supposed to be doing. A feeling of panic and anxiety emerges at the very thought of spending more time with myself. End quote. He argues that most men have such a limited sense of self that they are uncertain that they possess selves we could want to relate to. He contends, we only seem to learn that the self is something we have to control tightly, since otherwise it might upset our plans. We never really give ourselves so much as a chance to know ourselves better or develop more contact with ourselves, since all of this threatens the control we've been brought up to identify our masculinity with. We feel trapped, though we do not know how we are constantly remaking this trap for ourselves." End quote. Competition with other men in the workplace can make it all the more difficult for men to express feelings or to take time alone. The male who seeks solitude in the workplace, especially during downtimes, is seen as suspect. Yet when men gather together at work, they rarely have meaningful conversations. They jeer, they grandstand, they joke, but they do not share their feelings. They relate in scripted, limited ways, careful to remain within the emotional boundaries set by patriarchal thinking about masculinity. The rules of patriarchal manhood remind them that it is their duty as men to refuse relatedness. Even though male workers like Kenneth Blanchard, author of The One Minute Manager and co-author of The Power of Ethical Management, share the wisdom that relational skills should be cultivated by men to improve the nature of work and work relations, most work settings remain places where emotional engagement between workers, especially a boss and a subordinate, is deemed bad for business. Were more men in touch with their relational skills and their emotional life, they might choose work that would at least sometimes enhance their well-being. Although women with class privilege, such as Susan Faludi or Susan Bordo, who wrote about men, express surprise that most men do not see themselves as powerful, women who have been raised in poor and working class homes have always been acutely aware of the emotional pain of the men in their lives and of their work dissatisfactions. Had Susan Faludi read the work of feminist women of color writing about the poor and working class men whom we know most intimately, she would not have been quote unquote surprised to find masses of men troubled and discontent. Women with class privilege have been the only group who have perpetuated the notion that men are all powerful, because often the men in their families were powerful. When Faludi critiques the popular feminist notion that men are all powerful, she counts on the ignorance of readers about feminist writing to perpetuate the notion that feminists have not understood male pain. It serves her argument to promote this inaccurate portrait. Visionary feminists were writing about the fact that working-class men, far from feeling powerful, were terribly wounded by the patriarchy, long before Faludi conceived of Stift, and it is difficult to imagine that she was not aware of that writing. It is disingenuous of her as well to act as though the liberation movement that women created to confront their, quote, problem with no name, addressed women across class lines. Feminist movement has had very little impact on the masses of working-class women, who were in the workforce prior to the movement and who still remain there, just as dissatisfied and discontent with their lot as the men in their lives. Poor and working class women have always known that the everyday work experience places men in an environment where they feel powerless and where they are unable to articulate that on patriarchal terms. To use Faludi's words, they feel, quote, less than masculine, end quote. Just as feminist gains in this nation primarily had a positive impact, on women with class privilege, 
the working quote-unquote men who have been given permission from the contours of patriarchal culture to reconfigure the nature of work in their lives tend to have class power. In the late 80s and early 90s, a number of popular movies portrayed powerful men, either through illness or crisis, evaluating their lives and choosing to make profound changes in the nature of work. In the recent film, Life as a House, a white male architect whose work is being devalued quits, finds out that he has cancer and only a short time to live, and then engages in a process of rethinking patriarchy, although, of course, that term is not used. Evaluating his life, he chooses to use his remaining months to make emotional connections with family, especially his teenage son, and with friends. He spends his time learning how to give and receive love. His ex-wife's wealthy businessman husband, inspired by the example of the dying man, rethinks the nature of his life and resolves to give less time to work and more time to emotional connections. This film, like its predecessors, makes clear that working men must make time to get in touch with their emotional selves if they are to become men of feeling. The immensely popular Academy Award-winning movie, American Beauty, showed the primary character, Lester Burnham, depressed about his life, his work, his marriage, and his family. <clears throat> he has lost his capacity to feel. He stops taking work seriously and by the end is getting in touch with his feelings, yet he cannot redeem his life. He also dies like the protagonist in Life as a House. These movies seduce audiences with images of men in the process of growing up, but then they betray their characters and us by never letting these men live. They echo the patriarchal message that if a man stops work, he loses his reason for living. In Rediscovering Masculinity, Victor Sadler states that the male who defines himself through work seeks to do so because, quote, this is the only identity that can traditionally belong to us believing we can still prove our masculinity by showing we do not need anything from others, end quote. In American Beauty, Lester suffers alone. His critical investigation of his feelings takes place in his head, and he cannot survive being so utterly vulnerable and isolated. Ultimately, movies send the message to male audiences that men will not be meaningfully empowered if they learn to love. American Beauty finally tells audiences that there is no hope for depressed men who are willing to critically reflect on their lives. It tells us that even when men are willing to change, there is no place for them in patriarchal culture. The opening lines of the film say it all. My name is Lester Burnham. I am 42. In less than a year, I'll be dead. Of course, I don't know that yet. And anyway, I'm dead already. Popular culture offers us few or no redemptive images of men who start out emotionally dead. Unlike Sleeping Beauty, they cannot be brought back to life. But in actuality, individual men are engaged in the work of emotional recovery every day. But the work is not easy because they have no support systems within patriarchal culture, especially if they are poor and working class. And it is no accident that Life as a House, which shows a man rejecting patriarchy and finding his way, is not as successful as American Beauty. Poor and working class men suffering a job depression, despair about the quality of their intimate lives, a feeling of alienation or a sense of being lost, often turn to substance abuse to ease their pain. When they begin to seek recovery, AA is one of the few places they can go to do the work of getting well. In healing groups, they learn first and foremost that it is important to be in touch with their feelings, that they have a right to name those feelings. The success of AA is tied to the fact that the practice of recovery takes place in the context of community, one in which shame about failure can be expressed and male longing for healing validated. Visionary male healers such as John Bradshaw found the way to healing in these settings. Working class men I have interviewed who found in recovery the way back to emotional connection share that it is profoundly difficult to engage in this work, which is fundamentally anti-patriarchal and then leave these settings to re-enter patriarchal culture. One man talked about how his female partner was turned off by his willingness to express feelings, to tell his story. In her eyes, this was weakness. She insisted that now he was sober, he did not need to express these feelings anymore. Despite changes in the nature of gender roles, ours is still a patriarchal culture where sexism rules the day. If it were not so, men could see periods of unemployment as time outs where they could do the work of self-actualization, where they could do the work of healing. 
Many working men in our culture can barely read or write. Imagine if time away from work could be spent in exciting literacy programs for poor and working class men. Imagine a wage offered for this work of self-development. When patriarchy no longer rules the day, it will be possible for men to view themselves holistically, to see work as part of life, not their whole existence. In Love and Survival, Dean Ornish, sharing his personal struggle to work less, to make time for self-actualization, offers this insight. If the intention behind the work is to seek recognition and power, quote, hey, look at me. I'm special. I'm important. I'm worthy of your love and respect, end quote. Then you're setting yourself apart from others as a way of trying to feel connected to them. Setting yourself apart from others as a way of trying to feel connected to them. It seems so clear why this is self-defeating, and yet it is often the norm in our culture. When my self-worth was defined by what I did, then I had to take every important opportunity that came along, even if relationships suffered. When he began to choose to live holistically, Ornish was able to change this thinking about work. Gail Shee's Understanding Men's Passages contains autobiographical accounts by men wrestling with the knowledge that the work they do is promoting severe depression and unhappiness. These men grapple with choosing their emotional well-being over the paycheck, over the image of themselves as a provider. Lee May recalls, I was faced with two hard choices. One, stay in the job I was doing and choke. Strangle, die physiologically, psychologically, or quit, and face the possibility that we would crumble financially. He admits that his unhappiness with work had undermined the spirit of well-being in his home. Quote, Our household was an unhappy place, but had I stayed at the old jobs, my unhappiness would have pervaded our relationship. End quote. May was able to make the choice to leave his unhappy job and the work he went on to do, writing a book about his life as a globetrotting journalist, writing a popular column on gardening, was all work that enhanced his self-awareness, his self-actualization. His honest portrayal of his fears in breaking through denial is a model for many men who would learn to honor their inner selves rightly in a world that tells them every day that their inner selves do not matter. Courageously writing about how hard it was to break with the patriarchal values that had governed his thinking for years, Ornish shares that the practice of intimacy is healing. Quote, I am learning that the key to our survival is love. When we love someone and feel loved by them, somehow, along the way, our suffering subsides. Our deepest wounds begin healing. Our hearts start to feel safe enough to be vulnerable and to open a little wider. We begin experiencing our own emotions and the feelings of those around us. End quote. Imagine a non patriarchal culture where counseling was available to all men to help them find the work that they are best suited to, that they can do with joy. Imagine work settings that offer timeouts where workers can take classes in relational recovery, where they might fellowship with other workers and build a community of solidarity that, at least if it could not change the arduous, depressing nature of labor itself, could make the workplace more bearable. Imagine a world where men who are unemployed for any reason could learn the way to self-actualization. Women workers find that leaving the isolation of the home and working in a communal setting enhances their emotional well-being, even when wages are low and in no way liberating, as some feminist thinkers naively suggested that they might be. If men followed this example and used the workplace as a setting to practice relational skills, building community, the male crisis around work could be addressed more effectively. Many men who have retired from jobs, particularly men over 60 in our culture, often feel that aging allows them to break free of the patriarchy. With time on their hands, they are often compelled by extreme loneliness, alienation, a crisis of meaning or other circumstances to develop emotional selves. They are the elders who can speak to younger generations of men, debunking the patriarchal myth of work. Those voices need to be heard. They are the voices that tell younger men, quote, don't wait until your life is near its end to find your feeling, to follow your heart. Don't wait until it's too late, end quote. Work can and should be life enhancing for all men. When daring men come to work loved and loving, the nature of work will be transformed and the workplace will no longer demand that the hearts of men be broken to get the job done. The Will to Change Men, Masculinity, and Love
written by Bell Hooks. Chapter 6. Work. What's love got to do with it? Read and recorded by Sen Naomi Kirsch Schultz, June 14th, 2022.